Okay, folks, welcome to the Geo Talk after the Easter recess. Thank you for joining us. Today we have one of our own speaking to us, Dr. Ben Hayes, who's currently a research associate in the school. Uh, he was formerly, up until last year, a postdoctoral fellow, but has now been upgraded to a research associate. Uh, before joining us, he did his PhD at uh, Cardiff University, working on magmatic evolution of the Franklin Sill uh, and Dyke system in the, in the high Canadian Arctic. And before that, he worked on the Bushveld uh, complex, looking at the development of mottled and orthocytes at, Card at uh, Durham University. So, Ben, welcome. And thank you. And today, of course, he's talking about uh, an interesting case study um, from Angola, where we have a project together with Trish and Jeremy um, from UJ. And so this is an interesting aspect of the project. So thank you, Ben. OK. Um, thank you very much, Grant, for the introduction. Thank you all for uh, coming along this afternoon. Um, so yeah, I've been lucky enough to be involved in uh, the research going on in southwest Angola, thanks to Grant. So I've been working up there with Jeremy, Grant, and Tricia, uh, primarily trying to investigate the magmatic evolution of the Kunene and Orphocyte complex, so probably the largest Proterozoic massif type of Orphocyte on the planet. Um, but during that time as well, I've been helping Jeremy uh, try to understand the basement rock history of that same region. And uh, in the vicinity of the Kunene and Orphocyte complex, we discovered some beautiful granitoids with some fantastic textures. And this talk is going to focus on some field relationships from some of these particular granitoids associated with the Anorphocyte complex, and in particular, looking at how xenocrysts form. And I want to start off by just defining what a xenocryst is. I think we all in this room, as training geologists, um, have a good idea of what a xenocryst is. Um, everyone would offer a different definition for what a xenocryst is. They would all probably converge to a similar definition. And probably the, the least genetic uh, definition I can find in the, in the literature is from Ron Vernon's 2004 uh, textbook on microstructures. And that is, they are individual grains that are broken off the walls of the magma chamber and incorporated into the ascending magma. Uh, two cartoons here illustrating that process. On the left, we have uh, the top left corner of a large magma chamber in the crust and the contact with the wall rock. And in this scenario, some kind of turbulent convection in the magma may disrupt and disaggregate this contact with the wall rock, and that leads to solid wall rock material becoming incorporated into the magma chamber. If we have single crystals or single grains pulled into that magma, then we produce a xenocryst. If we break off big chunks, aggregates of this wall rock material, then we produce xenoliths. And we know all about this. This is, this is the process that contaminates magma, changes the... Uh, trace elements and isotopic systematics of magma. And if that's coupled with assimilation, fractional crystallization, then it all can do a few other funky things as well and make life complicated for geochemists. In this scenario on the right, we have this um, kind of text, very textbook, hypothetical looking magma chamber in the crust. And this is connected to a strange looking volcano at the surface uh, by a magma conduit. And magma conduits are probably the best types of environments to incorporate xenocrysts and xenolithic material because along this margin here, if it's fault controlled in particular, if melt flow is fault mediated, then we can disaggregate and brecciate this margin and that material can be incorporated mechanically into the magma. So this is generally how they form. This is what they look like in thin section. So this is a cross-polarized photomicrograph of a, I think it's some kind of mafic rich granite, a granite diorite or a diuretic granite diorite or whatever. Uh, and this here is a quartz xenocryst, which is in gross disequilibrium with this host matrix. And you can see that this margin of the xenocryst, this quartz xenocryst, is quite irregular, quite resorbed looking. And along the margin, we have cluster, a, a rim of horn blend crystals, which are in equilibrium with this melt. So again, from Vernon's textbook on uh, microstructures, most xenoliths and xenocrysts have angular or irregular shapes although xenocrysts may be rounded if they partly melt or also dissolve in the host magma. Conver uh, in contrast, xenocrysts would typically be polyhedral or skeletal habits. This is what they look like in magma. Um, so back to this original scenario where we have the incorporation of wall rock material into the magma chamber. This 
we can build two assumptions from this, and that is that xenocrysts are older than the magma, that this material, this wall rock material, was pre-existing at the time this magma was in place into the crust and started to crystallize, and that also we conventionally think of this process as being the transfer of solid material to magma. So I'm going to question these two assumptions during the talk, and hopefully by the end I will have convinced you that the opposite of this process is also possible, and that is that crystals, phenocrysts or megacrysts in magma can be transferred to the wall rock. And this has important implications for magmas in place in tectonic environments. And I'll draw on those wider implications when I conclude at the end. Uh, just to justify why xenocrysts are important, why they're useful, why we need to know about how they form and where they come from, uh, I'm going to just go through a few case studies. Uh, one in particular uh, example of where xenocrysts are important is that they can tell us about the lithospheric mantle, what composition it is, because obviously we can't direct directly access this part of, of the mantle to see what composition it is. And also we can see and infer what the composition of the lower crust is. So in this case we have an example of a geology paper where they discovered that there was Archean continental and mantle fragments in Camartiites in the Balingwe greenstone belt in Zimbabwe. And these are stereoscopic images showing here I think garnet grains and here OPX and CPX which are uh, collectively derived from the mantle lithosphere and also from the lower crust. And the chemistry tells us that so we can see what lies beneath where these commartiites were sourced and what kind of crustal material they pass through en route to the surface before being erupted. Crucially also they tell us that the ascent of this commartiite was rapid because otherwise these crystals hosted by the commartiite should have been melted. So these crystals came up in a rapidly transported commartiite melt from the, from the lithospheric mantle. Uh, another example is that they can tell us about the composition and the evolution of the crust with time. This is another geology paper looking at zircon xenocrysts extracted from ultra-potassic lavas in the Himalayan in Tibet. And basically we see on this plot on the right here, we can see a range of ages uh, of these zircons and they cluster at certain points. And these record magma magmatic flare-up events during the construction, the crustal building construction of the Himalayan crust. Uh, this particular bar here, this grey bar, corresponds to 55 million years. This is when the Indian continent crashed into Asia and that's when the whole crustal forming process began in the construction of the Himalayan belt. So very useful in lavas at being able to reconstruct crustal building events and magmatic flare-ups during uh, continental collision. Another example, something we're all very familiar with, is Lou Ashwell's uh, work. Uh, we saw the geo talk on this last month. And that is that if we find Archean zircons in very young lavas, then we can interpret or infer that there is old, differentiated continental crust beneath the source of where that magma came from. And we can track cryptic old pieces of continental crust uh, from prior extensional events. And if you're really lucky, then this can get you fame and example in stuff like Cosmo Cosmopolitan magazine. Uh, I'm sure Lou never expected to see his name in that, ma in that particular magazine. Um, okay. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, another example is something I'm very familiar with, working on continental flood basalt systems and layered intrusions uh, primarily, and that is that uh, xenocrysts in Basalts and rhyolites can tell us about the nature of plumbing system dynamics in basaltic plumbing systems and felsic plumbing systems. For example, another geology paper uh, in the Toba Tooth, uh, different types of plagioclase and amphibole, phenocrysts and xenocrysts were identified in the lavas, and this image here, uh, using various types of in situ chemistry. And also, example here of a resorbed olivine xenocryst hosted by a, a ground mass. So it's, it's in the disequilibrium with this melt and has been partly eaten and resorbed. And here's an example of a xenolith, a dunitic xenolith, probably a cumulate dunitic xenolith entrained in lavas brought up from depth. So basically, the presence of xenocrysts in these types of environments tell us about the types of processes going on in magmatic plumbing systems, where cumulates form, how they're disaggregated. And from this, we need to know what's, what's a xenocryst and what's a what's a phenocryst in the lava in order to backtrack and reconstruct what primary melt compositions are. These are all entrained cargo, they have different trace element signatures, they have different isotopic signatures hosted within here, so we need to remove these from the bulk rock compositions to be able to backtrack and work out what the primary magma composition is. 
So they're very important. And another example, and this kind of overlaps with some of the case studies I've shown, and that's the zircon problem. Now, this is a current theme in the literature. A lot of papers, a lot of research is focused on this at the moment. There's a geology paper, uh, a nature paper, for example, uh, basically suggesting or demonstrating that some zircons in rocks are not indicative of the crystallization age of that particular rock. So an example here from some uh, protozoic granites, these little black grains are zircon inclusions in K-feldspar, and in situ techniques demonstrate that these zircons hosted by these K-feldspar grains are older than the zircons that crystallize from the surrounding granite. So it's very important to understand what's a xenocrist in these types of rocks so that we're not misinterpreting the age formation of these types of, of, these types of magmas. So it just emphasizes that we need to know we need to have good textual control when we're working out the age of rocks. So now I want to whisk you to uh, southwest Angola, where this work, uh, the focus of this talk will be on. Uh, this is a uh, Precambrian tectonic framework map of south, uh, south central Africa. Uh, down here is the Angolan Shield, part of the Congo Craton. And this, all of this material is uh, recording crustal growth from the Mesoarchean through to the Meso Proterozoic. And we're going to focus down on the Angolan Shield where we've been working. We've been working in this particular region down here. The Angolan Shield is this fragment here. This is the border uh, of, Ang uh, of Angola around here. And this uh, Angolan Shield has been broken down into three blocks. We have the Central Shield Zone over here. We have the Central Ibernian Zone. And down here we have the Lubango Zone. And these are recording rock ages sort of between uh, Mesoarchean ages and Paleo Proterozoic ages. But predominantly, well, uh, the, the geology of this region is dominated by this purple belt, this north to northeast trending purple belt, which is the Kunene anorphosite complex, this 1.3 billion year old protozoic massif type anorphosite that we've been focused on in southwest Angola. Um, this is some of Alan's work he did for his masters, looking at the remote sensing and uh, imaging this protozoic anorphosite in, in order to work out the dimensions and the structure of this body. This is a, a Landsat image just showing the body. It's about 200 kilometers, maybe over, uh, greater than that in, in length from south to north. This block down here is in Namibia. This is the Zebra Lobe Mountain. The border is along the Kuneni River, somewhere through here. And these images just have, have been tried to, have been used to try and interpret what the, uh, the structure and what the Pluton structure of this anorphosite complex uh, is. And, um, Here's just some photos showing some of the geology in that re region. This is our camp down here. Uh, this, is a, this is a quarry where they're taking dimension stone out for uh, kitchen surfaces or whatever. And this is what the general geology looks like in that region. We have just general hip, sort of flat areas and then hills, which are just dominated by anorphosite. And uh, arguably, anorphosite, protozoic anorphosites are fairly boring to think about because they're just dominantly one mineral. But these rocks, when you get your eye in there and you look in detail at some of the outcrops, actually preserves some pretty nice structures and textures. There's an example here of a pegmatoidal anorphosite. You can see the twinning in some of these plagioclase grains of interstitial orthoperoxine. And these textural variations can, uh, can vary over the meter scale, even over the centimeter scale, when you really look in detail at these rock types. Also, as well, you can see some layering here. You see a more a higher color index in the rocks here, they contain more orthoperoxine, and then a bit of a, a lighter color index up here because there's less orthoperoxine. So there's been layering development in some of these anorphosites. And here, this is an example of a, a very highly evolved pegmatitic segregation in the anorphosite, recording late stage melt <coughs> differentiation, the very late stage melt evolution of these types of rocks. So there's loads of cool textures and structures in these rocks that we can use to sort of interpret how this anorphosite formed. But also associated with this anorphosite complex are a series of granitoids. And they have the same age as the Cuneli complex, which is one, between 1 1.3 and 1 1.4 billion years old, perhaps even older than that, as we're now discovering. Um, and some of these granites, generally they're K-feldspar-rich red granites. And we can see, based on the field relationships, that they're very closely associated with the anorphosite complex. And in some cases, we can even see blocks and fragments of anorphosite hosted by the granite, implying that some of the anorphosite had been in place prior to granitoid emplacement. And these granitoids are probably either anatectic melts of crustal material when this anorphosite was coming up and intruding and, and melting the surrounding crust. Alternatively, 
they could be residual liquids derived from extreme late stage fractionation of these anorphocyte complexes. Nevertheless, there are granitoids associated with this anorphocyte, and one particular type of uh, granitoid in this area is the chelogranite, and it's this pink belt here. So we're now focusing in more detail into southwest Angola. This blue here is the Kunene anorphocyte complex, the western margin of the complex. This is Paleozoic cover, this is Quaternary cover. And this belt of chelogranite sits at the boundary between the anorphocyte and this 1.8, or between 1.8 and 2 billion year old Ibernian crustal material, basement material. And I'm going to focus on this area here around Onconqua, and in particular this place here called Onconqua Platform. First, I just want to show you some of the rocks we found in this region. Uh, beautiful, this is from the, uh, the, the crustal material, the basement surrounding this area, and we see beautiful magmatitic uh, rocks with leucosomes, with peritectic garnet development in there as well. This is some of the rocks that Jeremy's working on at the moment in terms of understanding the, uh, basal, uh, the basement structure and the, the tectonic history and the regime of that area prior to the anorphosite formation. This is located down here. We're now going to move up just north of Onconqua Village to Onconqua Platform, and these are the rocks which I'm going to focus the talk on today. And they are quite spectacular looking sort of lozenges or enclaves of a, a finer grain, darker rock hosted by this mega crystal granite. I'll show these lithologies in detail now. Uh, so here, this is this fine grained, uh, it's actually a tonalite or granodiorite. Uh, the E has hopped onto a different line there, sorry about that. Um, and they have a stromatic uh, layering and foliation preserved. They are partly magmatized. You can see these bands of lighter layers are stromatic uh, uh, layering, uh, characteristic of the early formation of magmatite. Uh, and in the megacrystic uh, granite, this is called cello granite, it's kind of uh, granite or, or cyanite granite in composition. You can see uh, K feldspar megacrysts hosted in a matrix of also K feldspar, plagioclase, some plagioclase quartz, and also hornblende. So there's two distinctive lithologies at this locality. And one possible interpretation of this outcrop, if uh, a granitoid specialist or a magmatic, any kind of petrologist really kind of just walked across this outcrop, one interpretation would be that this is a mafic magmatic enclave system. So these are well documented in granitoids across the globe. You go to any kind of granite batholith, you'll find uh, darker colored enclaves of more mafic material hosted by granite. And this could be one interpretation of that outcrop is that simply we have a mafic magmatic enclave system. And how they form is something like this. This cartoon just illustrates a crystallizing granite. You have intrusion of a basaltic magma or mafic magma into this crystallizing granite. And because of the viscosity contrast between these two, you have disaggregation of this basalt, and it breaks up into a series of enclaves which fracture, mechanically break up, and are incorporated into the granite. Eventually, they will kind of hybridize, and you can see it goes from darker, more mafic colors here to lighter, more hybridized colors as it inherits some of the melt in that granite. And also, what can happen is that it can inherit some of the crystals. So some of the crystals which were forming in the granite over here are eventually hosted and incorporated in these enclaves. However, this is not, this can't explain the observations we see on Conqueror Platform because we have intrusive relationships. This uh, megacrystic granite, if you look in detail around the outcrop, you can see that the stromatic, uh, stromatic uh, layering and magmatitic layering in the fine-grained uh, tonalite is truncated by the cello granite. This megacrystic granite was intrusive into this country rock. Also as well, a bit further south, uh, along strike from on Conqua platform, we see a, a, a much bigger zone of cello granite, and we can find xenoliths, blocks, this one's about eight meters in length, uh, xenoliths of this magmatitic tonalite hosted by the cello granite, again implying that this material was the, was the country rock at the time that this cello granite was in place. So we don't think this is a mafic magmatic enclave system because the temple relationships well, the field relationships imply that the chronological sequence was that this granite came in later and not before this finer grain tonalite. I'm going to zoom into this margin here, which is quite nice looking. Uh, so this is the contact. This is the cello granite up here, megacrystic cello granite. This is that magmatitic tonalite. And at the margin of this scene lift, you can see how the magma has propagated into the uh, foliation, the weaknesses in this xenolith. This xenolith preserves 
schematic um, layering and this orientation, and you can see how this cello granite is propagating along these weaknesses, roughly parallel or sub-parallel to the, weakness, uh, the weaknesses in this uh, xenolith. Kind of illustrates a small-scale uh, conception of how this uh, intrusive process works. And we also think that not only is this cello granite intrusive into this fine-grained tonalite, but we can say that this intrusion of this cello granite was syntectonic. Uh, the, the lozenge appearance of this outcrop can be explained by isoclinal folding. So we see uh, S1 foliation planes converging uh, to form isoclinal folds, which defines an S2 foliation plane. And the contacts with the cello granite are parallel with this S2 foliation, implying that this cello granite not only intruded this fine-grained rock, but also intruded during the deformation of this fine-grained unit, high uh, compressional deformation into isoclinal folds. So this is what's facilitating granite's intrusion and uh, is what al what's allowing the space for it to intrude and the weaknesses for it to follow. So granite came along, for instance, here, along the, uh, the hinge kind of part of this uh, axle plane and this isoclinal fold. Again, here we see more examples, a bit more complex looking, but generally we see S1 kind of rotated to parallelism with this S2 foliation, and we can see that granite, uh, cello granite pathways follow this, or are parallel to this S2 foliation, again implying that this granite came in during deformation of the host tonalite. We also see uh, deformation history in the cello granite preserve as well. So here we see a, a kind of magmatic foliation, which is parallel north-south. And then locally in this cello granite, we can see nisos banding, which is also parallel to the S2 foliation that's developed in the fine-grained rock, implying that deformation was also active in some parts of this granite, which may have been in, pr in, in place prior to some that in, uh, exploited the uh, D, um, S2 weaknesses. This is a close-up just showing, so we can see here the red dashed lines just mimic the magmatic foliation in this cello granite. And as you progress towards this localized zone of deformation, you can see there's a strong grain size reduction. These, you have uh, now K feldspar porphyroclasts instead of these megacrysts, and you have quartz ribbons and uh, hornblende and micas parallel to this S2 foliation. So there's deformation preserved in this granite, which is parallel with the deformation in the host rock, implying that this magma was intruded during deformation of the entire platform. But what we also see around this area, uh, the, this fine-grained tonalite also hosts uh, cave feldspar megacrysts, which are very uh, like those hosted in the cello granite. So for instance, here we can see these partly detached cave feldspar megacrysts uh, detached away from these channel ways of cello granite and are now incorporated in the country rock. And here as well, you see an example uh, there's lots of cave feldspar megacrysts hosted by this fine-grained tonalite. So the country rock appears to contain cave feldspar megacrysts which are hosted in the intrusive rock. Again, here you see more examples of these cave feldspar grains which should be in this cello granite but are now hosted entirely by the country rock. And just to verify if these crystals are indeed uh, from the cello granite and not inherited somewhere else uh, or a part of this fine-grained magmatic system, we just looked at the, uh, we did the probe work and looked at the chemistry of these cave feldspars. And generally, all of the cave feldspars, be it those hosted in the cello granite or those hosted in the country rock, have the same composition between around, it, it averages around 90 in terms of orthoclase content on this diagram. So all the compositions of these crystals are the same. Uh, also as well, we see, uh, this will be important after, uh, the barium zonation, these are profiles across crystals, so this is the core, these are the rims on the, each side, and the barium profiles display fairly normal zonation across these crystals. So the implication of the chemistry and what our interpretation was based on, or our inference was based on the field relationships is that we have both megacrysts, K feldspar megacrysts in the cello granite, and we also have K feldspar xenocrysts. So the same compositions, they're the same population of crystals, but they occur in two different types of environments. So the question is, how did these Cella K feldspar megacrysts get into the country rock? How did they, how were they transferred from the granite into the, the wall rock, the country rock that hosts this granite? And the field evidence preserves two mechanisms for this process. We have both melt loss 
during syn magmatic deformation, and we also have megacrist transfer caused by a, competition, uh, um, a viscosity gradient across the contact between these two units. And I'm going to go into detail about both of these right now. So the one scenario is that we have melt squeezed out of these magma conduits. So here you can see the cello granite again, this magmatic foliation parallel north-south. And then here we have a contact with the fine-grained tonalite. And what we see around this outcrop is places where there are preserved conduits or sheets of cello granite parallel to the weaknesses in the fine-grained rock, which seem to be missing some of its granitic components. So in this case here, we have uh, this, this white arrow just indicates that it connects just up here to the, the bulk cello granite around it. But this is an hypothesis essentially of cello granite parallel to the weaknesses in the fine-grained rock. And we can see that these K Feldspar crystals are significantly longer and larger than the dimensions of this channel wave. This implies that this was once a conduit, a magma granite conduit, that was transporting more melt, but that melt has been lost. And what's left behind are these rigid megacrysts becoming xenocrysts, becoming entirely enveloped by this fine grained country rock. But here, some of the melt residual to these crystals was able to crystallize before it was completely. Uh, sucked out or drained out of this conduit. But this essentially was the process by which these megacrysts became xenocrysts by squeezing out. So these, these fabrics run north-south like this. So the, um, you could pull out the layering from the screen right now. So the melt has probably gone up or down relative to those fabrics. So it's been drained out of the system. Here's another example, very similar. But in this case, we have a very thin tail or very thin tails either side of what's kind of almost become a xenolith. So again, we have this white dashed line just mimicking the foliation, S2 foliation in the host rock. We have a contact with a larger sheet of cello granite up here. And this band here has almost been completely drained of its melt during progressive deformation, which is closing these magma conduits up. But in this case, we have, if, if these tails were completely lost and their melt was, was removed, we would be left with a xenolith. So, we're kind of envisaging or seeing the process for how material can be incorporated into the host rock. There's another example here. You can see the connection with the uh, cello granite down here. And this apophysis comes up as parallel with the foliation in this fine-grained country rock. And you can see that this xenocrist uh, or this megacrist is almost completely detached from this very thin uh, 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 conduit of cello granite and has almost become a xenocrist. So this is how crystals were being transferred to the wall rock material. Again, there's another example where the uh, connection between these xenocrysts is not so apparent. More melt has been lost. And you can see that there's K Feldsbar crystals of various sizes just preserved, mimicking uh, where this melt conduit, magma conduit, once was. So the rock record preserves the evidence of where melt was flowing and how these crystals became detached from the cello granite. So that's one way in which these xenocrysts formed is by melt drainage from magma conduits, melt loss essentially. And the evidence, and there is also evidence for melt loss from the surrounding cello granite also. You can see in the cello granite, we see accumulations of K Feldspar crystals, uh, clustering of crystals uh, in localized concentrations. And this is very indicative in granite solidification of melt loss and bringing crystals together. So melt has been lost from these environments in order to bring and cause the clustering of K Feldspar megacrysts. Likewise, uh, in places where megacrysts in the granite impinge at high angles, we have these curved uh, grain boundaries between crystals. Again, indicative of kind of like pressure solution processes where there is melting of grains and the loss of this melt uh, from the granite system. So there's melt loss from the granite and also there's melt loss from these conduits which were intruding weaknesses in the country rock. So melt loss is one way in which these megacrysts were transferred to the country rock to produce xenocrysts. The second mechanism that's preserved and we see the field relationships for is stronger megacrysts indenting weaker country rock. So during the emplacement of this cello granite, this uh, fine-grained wall rock, wall rock country rock became firmly softened and these stronger, and we have an even weaker ground mass in this granite, uh, cello granite. And then these strong uh, megacrysts were able to then sort of migrate towards and impinge on this weaker country rock. And there's another example here where we see 
uh, the foliation in the uh, host rock tonalite being truncated and wrapping around these crystals, which are basically moving, migrating towards the softer rock. So we have two ways of producing xenocrist. We have melt loss from magma conduits, and we also have crystals being, captured, being sort of uh, caught in the act, if you like, of migrating towards the fine-grained country rock. So we can kind of just uh, in, uh, build up a cartoon to kind of schematically show what's going on. Uh, in this case here, we have the early onset of D2 folding. So this is the country rock of its S1 fabric, and it starts to be folded. And during the folding process, uh, we have the intrusion of Chela granitoid carrying these K Feldspar crystals. And as we have continued deformation, progressive deformation eventually will have this S1 fabric completely transposed into a north-south trending S2 foliation. And eventually, we'll have the closure of granite conduits and the trapping of megacrysts in this granite eventually in the country rock, where magma has been squeezed out, it's left, it's gone out of the screen towards the surface, most likely. And eventually, we have the closure of these conduits parallel to weaknesses and uh, parallel to this S2 foliation and the envelopment of these megacrysts so that they become xenocrysts in the wall rock material. So we have evidence from this location that xenocrysts formed by crystal, crystal transfer from magma to solid, which is the opposite of the traditional interpretation for how xenocrysts form, which and also in this case we have, we have xenocrysts which are younger than their host rock. So the granite is the younger rock and crystals from that younger rock have been transferred to an older unit. Therefore, the typical assumptions of what xenocrysts are and what they represent are challenged by this model. And there are wider implications to sum up of this model, and that is the chronological interpretation of rocks which contain xenocrysts in the field may be wrong, because some of those crystals may be younger than the rocks within which they're hosted. In addition, this has implications for contamination and partial melt modeling. Uh, when you take contaminants, lower crystal contaminants, some of these rocks may have inherited crystals and therefore you don't have a true bulk rock composition of the rock that was melted uh, subsequently to produce magmas higher up in the crust. And this process may be ubiquitous, maybe a common process in convergent plate margins where granite magmas intrude during deformation, you may get the transfer of crystals and cargo from granites into deformed country rocks. And there are no studies that we can find in the literature which deal with this potentially fairly common scenario. And in, in summary, going back to some of those case studies I showed, you need to be very careful with zircon ages because uh, zircons can also be transferred in a similar way to this and therefore measured ages of zircons might not be representative of the rocks within which they're hosted. And that is that. Thank you very much. Ben, thank you for a really, really no interesting talk. Are there any questions? Please try to speak loudly so the microphone can see. Good. <laughs> could be, yeah. Uh, we'd have to do all the geochemical modeling of that and to, to see if the two are related, and, um, but it's possible. Well, I, I but don't see any we, field textures or you know, yeah, yeah. That, would, that would discount something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a question and a few comments. Um, dealing with this slide and similar ones, uh, I've noticed that Yeah. Right, for example, yeah. In this example, yeah. Yeah. Um, which means that whatever granite was there originally as a, as a, as a liquid then the liquid was squeezed out. Somehow this was, you know, had more time to grow larger. 
Yeah. No, definitely. I, I, we also think that the, this granite is actually heterogeneous on the meter scale. So there's probably multiple sheets of granite all <laughs> juxtaposed to each other. And uh, during deformation, different types of granites, very similar compositionally but texturally slightly different, have been juxtaposed and brought together. So uh, some of these conduits may be recording a slightly different cooling history or, uh, or were in place slightly before a sheet uh, immediately adjacent to it. Um, so it's certainly possible that there's, there's heterogeneity on, on, yeah. on this so small scale. The, the comments are that you, you find very similar textures to this in the Cape granites mm. uh, at sea point. The, no. the famous intrusive contact between the Cape granites and the, the Malmesbury Tergite. You see very similar things. But I've also seen in other places, um, not necessarily related to synthetic granites, but you see uh, granites with uh, lots of big, maybe looking in those zinolids, you see large, very mm. crispy transport mm -hmm. like this, yeah. uh, without the, the kind of evidence that you've shown here for you know, mm -hmm. mechanism mm -hmm. driving this is. So I'm wondering whether there's not a third mechanism for growing these things, is that they actually grow within the, the uh, zinolids. Uh, maybe there's some fluid access, but actually they're actually growing within these unclenched, mm. uh, you know, magnetically linked to the host. Uh, possibly, uh, uh, maybe, probably, uh, at some point. Um, uh, this sounds a bit more complicated than, than what the field evidence kind of shows. Uh, it's also very similar to the original models for how granite's formed by granitization, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it, it's possible. Um, if there's, if there's chemi chemical communication between this conduit and this main mass of granite, maybe melt could have been fed through some kind of intricate system. Uh, from that, from which that crystal grew, but uh, that would be, a, I think, that would be a far more complicated explanation for some of the features that are preserved here. Ben, uh, I just wanted to know if there's a larger structural context that may be being shown here. Mm. Um, you, your model essentially could be represented by coaxial tapping, which is you find yeah. all the layers. Mm. But there's a, there's evidence of some sort of fabric asymmetry and myelinization, mm -hmm. even in the granite. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm struck by the granite matrix in places. It almost looks like some of these uh, mega crisps, like this one here. This one. Yeah. 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 You know, you've got those shards <coughs> all lining up almost in an imbricate pattern. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you probe those, would you find that they're actually fragments of originally larger granite, so with the bearing content, for instance, mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. is something important. Um, so, Melt transport is often modeled as being favored in big shear zones. Yeah. Is there a big vertical shear zone here? And I mean, the artwork is just showing you little yeah. snapshots. Uh, probably, right, Jeremy? Yeah. <laughs> this, this, this whole region tectonically is, is, a, is a shear zone, I suppose, and we're just seeing one little snapshot of it right here. Um, yeah, so. so I, yeah. 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 No, no, it's, it's been squeezed. Yeah, exactly, like exactly. Squeezed yeah. Um, yeah. 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 All right, any further questions? Okay, well, if not, Ben, thank you once again. It's a really You're welcome. Talk. Before you all leave, next week's speaker, I believe, and Judith can confirm, is Richard Montjoy, I think, yes. on the Lesejo project. I'm not sure what it's about, that project, but come and find out next week. I should also mention that if you aren't able to come to the GeoTalks, we are now posting them to YouTube. So if you can't make it, you can't get out of the office, you're studying for a test, you can watch them now on YouTube. All right, and of course, thank you to John Hancock. Thank you.